Hello, everybody. How are you this morning? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope that you're a little better. Are you better now? Yeah? What is it about a guy holding a baseball bat? You always feel like he's coming after you. Eh? Hey, is it just me who thinks that? We used to, uh, I used to coach uh, baseball. My son, Alexander, played a little league, and uh, it was a lot of fun to, to play. And uh, one summer, uh, one spring, I was working with a kid. We'll call his name Ricky. And Ricky had this amazing ability. This is, Ricky is five years old, and uh, he had this amazing ability right off the hop. Ricky had the ability to, like, have the perfect batter's stance for a major league ball player at five years old. Ricky would take his bat, and he'd walk, he'd walk in, right, and he's got that look already, <laughs> right? He'd walk in, and he'd just be like... <clears throat> Kick, spit, rub, stare at the pitcher, kick it in, grab his bat, tap, tap. <laughs> then he raised that bat up nice and high, Roberto Alomar esque, and he'd just be up there and he'd just be staring, ready to kill that ball. Now, Ricky had the problem that he sucked at baseball. And the poor kid didn't hit for like 10 weeks. It took us 10 weeks of coaching. But every time he got up there, man, he just looked phenomenal. He did. He looked like he was just going to crush it. And uh, Ricky had great form, but no content. And I don't know how many of you guys know people whose lives resemble that. They got great form. They look great on the outside, but there's no content behind it. And each and every one of us knows that integrity matters, doesn't it? Integrity matters. We are in a series right now called Clash of Clans where we are preparing ourselves for the battle that is all around us. And there is a battle between good and evil. Uh, Whether you recognize it or not, Satan absolutely has a plan for you. He would love to steal, kill, and destroy Uh, all parts of your life. That is his plan for you, but God also has a plan, and then we have a plan, and so there is this clash of plans where Satan wants something for us, we want something for us, and and God wants something for us, and and there is a battle between good and evil going on inside of me even, uh, in my thoughts, in my struggles, in my fears, in my doubts, in my dreams, in my goals. There are these conflicts at work, And Christ followers are constantly in the midst of a fierce war. Um, Whether you are a Christ follower or not, uh, this message today is mostly directed towards towards Christ followers. But if you're just checking things out, you get to just enjoy what it is that's happening today. Maybe glean a few things from it and watch the rest of the Christians really kind of like um, struggle today. Isn't that going to be fun? So you get to enjoy people watching today if you are not a Christ follower. Just watch them squirm. It's going to be a lot of fun. At least it was for me this week, watching myself in the mirror totally squirm as I came up with this week's message because it is something that hit home truly hard for me this morning. Um, So we are in a war against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. And we can't battle those spiritual forces that threaten to derail our lives if we are not living with integrity, which means we are committed to walking the talk in each of the areas of our lives, such as our moral life, our financial life, our sexual lives, our relational lives. What we say is right is what it is that we do. It's why Paul tells us that we need to put on the armor of God because we are in a battle and nobody goes into battle naked. Right? It'd be stupid to go into a battle naked, wouldn't it? And so this morning, what it is that Paul tells us is to put on the belt of truth. Here it is here. This happy little belt will cover up the tidy whities He'd be just fine now. This week, we are looking at the belt of truth. Um, and, and we're going to put on the belt of truth by living with integrity. Paul says, go stand ready with truth as a belt tied around your waist. Now, the belt of truth holds up more than your pants uh, or your war kilt, as Barbarian Frank is showing for us this morning. Um, It is 
meaning that uh, if you don't have truth at the core of your life, that your life will fall apart and spiritual darkness will absolutely take over. We put on the belt of truth by living with integrity. Now, integrity comes from the word integer. And for those mathematicians out there, uh, you know that integer means unit of one, a whole number. To live a life of integrity, you don't just know the truth, you actually have to live it out as well. Meaning what it is that you say and what it is that you do are the same thing. You are one and the same. You are wholly living a life of truth. Of course, living with integrity doesn't mean living with perfection. It doesn't mean that, uh, that you get it right all of the time, otherwise nobody would ever be able to live with integrity. If perfection was the standard of integrity, we would all just suck eggs. We stumble all the time. To live with integrity, we have to let people know on the outside what it is that's going on on the inside. It means what it is that you see is who it is that I am. Hypocrisy is the great enemy of integrity. We practice, we practice hypocrisy when we know the truth and we just don't do it. It's when what we say isn't the same as what it is that we do. And it's dangerous. It is very dangerous. A lack of integrity in any area of your life will absolutely leave you vulnerable to Satan's arrows. And the fact is, the moment you start segmenting your life, into different pieces, your work life. No, that's over here. I, how it is that I am at work and how it is that I home, uh, those are different things. Your family life. No, what it is that's going on in my family, what is the rest of me is like, those are different. My sex life. Sure, I do those things that are in behind closed doors, but the rest of me, no, I'm like this, but that part is separate from me. Your moral life. Sure, I'm a good guy, I am, but I got this thing that I just do on the side, but that isn't part of who it is that I am. You are segmented. You are no longer one. You are no longer whole. You're dividing yourself. And you've lost your integrity. You're not living with a oneness in all areas of your life. And the scary thing is that Jesus talked about that kind of person. Really what it is that you're being when you do that is you're being religious. You're being a religious hypocrite. And Jesus' words are somewhat unsettling. At least they were for me. He talks about these people like wolves in sheep clothing. He talks about them, he calls them vipers. He calls them snakes. He calls them blind fools. Jesus, the most loving, kind person to ever walk the earth, calls them children of hell. Oh, that freaks me out a little bit. Because if Jesus, the most loving person to ever walk the earth, talks this way about hypocrites, I had better get my integrity aligned. I'd better figure this out. One of Jesus' disciples, Matthew, recorded something that I want to look at in a moment that is so important regarding the difference between religion and spirituality. Um, and this passage defines, perhaps more than any other uh, passage in, in, in the Bible, what the difference means for us in our lives. Religion is just good form. It's when behavior that once had depth, that once had meaning, has become ritual. It's just become what it is that we do, not who it is that we are. It doesn't come from anything of depth. The essence of spirituality goes beyond the surface level, and it reveals the heart of an individual. It is possible to be religious and still miss out on a relationship with God. Being religious is not enough, even if you're good at it. Being religious is not enough. If you want to have a relationship with God, you have to go beneath the surface of religion and experience a heart-changing, a daily soul-changing, a daily uh, emotion-changing, spiritually spiritual connection with Jesus. That is something that is something that we work on daily. And this isn't easy. Because if, if we're really honest, folks, we are a society that absolutely is obsessed with the form rather than the content. The form is what it is that we're interested in. We're, we're not always as concerned, we're, we're, we're oftentimes more concerned about the package than we are what's inside the package itself. 
Did you know that a microwave dinner, they spend more money on the packaging than they do on the food that goes inside it? Sure, you open it up and you realize, oh, okay, that's why. <laughs> but they've realized that people won't even buy those things unless they look really good, so they put a ton of money into how it is that they look. Or every, every year, People Magazine puts out... Uh, 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 publishes an issue called The 50 Most Beautiful People. How many of you have ever seen that issue before? It's the most popular issue that they put out every single year. Uh, the 50 Most Beautiful People in the World. I can only guess that I am number 51 uh, because every year they tend to go right by me. I don't know why. Um, but this is truly one of their most popular issues. And according to the world standards, these are beautiful people. They really are. Um, when you look uh, a little bit closer, though, you look beyond their perfect smile, you look beyond their perfect hair, and you look beyond their beautiful airbrushed bodies, and you look to the core of who it is that they actually are, you're going to see that they are just as messed up as each and every one of us are. They are, if not more so. I mean, their lives are characterized by dysfunction and selfishness and conflict and on and on and on. They may be the 50 most beautiful people in the world, but they're not the 50 most healthy people in the world, and they're not the 50 most emotionally well-adjusted people in the world, and they're not the 50 most loving people in the world. They're not. But of course, an entire issue to dedicated to any of those things, people just wouldn't buy, because we're more interested in form than we are in content. It's easier to project an image than it is to actually have the substance behind the image. You know, growing up, there was a, a church leader who I admired greatly. He was, uh, he was uh, just, I, I look at him and I go, oh man, that's awesome. I, I, I see this family come in together and they had a beautiful home. Uh, his wife was just lovely and charming. The kids were so friendly and kind and I'd see them kneeling together, taking communion together and I'd say, man, that's what it is that I want for my family. And one time I was talking to his son, and I knew him, and I said, man, that's what it is that I want for a family. And he's like, man, you don't want to be like my family. I'm like, what are you talking about? I see you guys at church all the time. He's like, dude, my dad is angry all the time. He's never in a good mood. And nothing I do or any of my sister does is anywhere good enough for him. You see us kneeling together to pray, but you don't see how my dad made my mom cry on the way to church this morning. He is not as he appears. I couldn't believe what it is that I was hearing about this father, but apparently it was true. Eventually their marriage ended in divorce. And that's kind of the problem, isn't it, with putting all of your effort into the packaging? Eventually the packaging gets opened. If you're projecting an image of wealth but are living beyond your means, eventually it'll catch up with you. If you're projecting an image of having a perfect marriage and family life but your relationships are filled with anger and hostility, then eventually it will catch up with you. If you're projecting a public image of being a moral and upright and having it all together type of person, but secretly there is just sin and, and poor choices racking your life, then eventually it will catch up with you. Eventually, the package always gets opened and people will see the contents of what's inside. <coughs> Good form is just simply not enough. A pretty package is not enough. You gotta develop the content by working on it and being vulnerable about it. Because the greatest tragedy that you could ever experience is to spend your life perfecting the form and neglecting the content. Let's try something. Can we try something this morning? Can we do a little, little thump, thump, thump? Okay. Here's what I want you to try for me, okay? I want you to picture somebody in your mind, a person in your mind who you totally respect, somebody who you totally look up to, it, an acquaintance of some sort that you've met, that you just look at that person and you go, oh man, they're awesome. Just Picture somebody in your head right now that you're like, oh man, I just hold that person in such high regard. And I want you to put them in that little blank that's right there, okay? That little line that's right there. Put their name there, okay? 
The test of integrity that I want us to work with for a little while is that your public life and your private life match. That what's in your heart and what's in your life are the same thing. You ask yourself this tough question, okay? Here's the tough question I want you to ask yourself. Would I do this if blank was in the room? Whoever that is in your life. Ask yourself when you're living out your life, would I do this if blank was in the room? Would I watch this? Would I click on this in the, on the computer if blank was in the room? Would I um, treat my spouse like this if blank was in the room? Would I talk to my kids this way if blank was in the room? Would I treat that other person this way if blank was in the room? Would I spend my money on this if blank knew what it is that was going on in my bank account? Whatever you do behind closed doors, would you care if someone who you truly admired and respected was in the room if they saw you acting that way? That's the integrity test. But the truth is, when it comes to integrity, even if that person wasn't in the room, you could fool everybody else, but you can't fool yourself. And eventually, your conscience will catch up with you, and you will pay for your choices. Yet sometimes, we know the right thing that we're supposed to do, and we just choose not to do it. And oftentimes, I'll meet Christ followers, and they'll say, I know I'm doing the wrong thing, but I'm just... They think this, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it because I know that God is a forgiving God. Can I, can I ask this with all of the love that I can truly totally muster? What kind of fool do you think God is? What kind of fool do you take him for? Do you think that you can do something that is totally wrong and you won't have consequences in your life? That's the very reason that he doesn't want you to make that decision, because he loves you. And he doesn't want you to stop doing the things that are fun. He wants you to stop doing the things that are stupid, because it hurts you. And every time you make a dumb choice, it leaves a scar. He knows every bad decision that you make, and he loves you. Does this mean that God doesn't forgive us? No, absolutely, he forgives us. He will completely wipe the slate clean and we'll get to start over fresh. However, you got to walk out the consequences of your decision. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. As a person sows, so shall they reap. And if you continue to make stupid choices, you'll be forgiven and grumpy. You'll be forgiven and dysfunctional. You'll be forgiven and walking in a miry mess. He is a forgiving and gracious God, but that forgiveness does not free us from the pain and misery of consequences that come from bad decisions. You can be forgiven and still have regrets. You can be forgiven and still face the pain. You can be forgiven and still have a broken relationship. You can be forgiven and still lose rewards. Romans 14, verse 14 says this, if someone believes it is wrong, then he shouldn't do it because for him it is wrong. This verse simply says that when in doubt, don't. It's a violation of the integrity test. You know, this week, I, I sold my truck for $445 on Cranbrook Bid Wars. <laughs> yes. It was a beauty. Sad to see him go. When the girl came to pick up the truck, she asked me if I would be willing to say that I sold it to her for less money that she, on the transfer form that she wouldn't have to pay as many taxes. And I thought, well, that'd be nice for her, right? I mean, it's the kind, it would be a kind thing for me to do for her. But then I threw it past the integrity test. And I'm like, would Ian Bird, my pastor friend from Calgary, who I totally admire and respect, be stoked that I wrote down and lied on a government form about the price that this person paid me for it? And I'm like, ugh. Fine, I have to be the bad guy. I'm sorry, I have to write down on the form what it is that you paid me. Things got a little awkward at that point. She was quite bubbly and happy until I decided to do the right thing. And that'll be oftentimes the way that it is. Um, awkward, 
when you do the right thing, but totally freeing. See, I, uh, I don't want to spend my life playing games. I don't want to spend my life remembering the lies that I've made prior so that when somebody asks me about what it is that I said at that time, I don't have to remember if I said the truth or not because I just always choose to say the truth. So much more freeing. <laughs> Ugh, huge weight off because I never lied. Jesus shows us what we can do to ensure the content of our lives is equal to or greater than the form of our lives. Matthew, as I, I said earlier, was somebody who spent time with Jesus, and he wrote down uh, for us a journal of everything that he remembered about Jesus. This is his eyewitness account. Uh, and he said, Jesus, he records Jesus as saying this. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. Uh, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Now, Jody and I were driving by yesterday and we saw some sheep out in the, in the uh, 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 farm that we were looking at. We're looking at the little cute lambs. They look so nice. Look at the sheep. They're so sweet. And that's how it is that these people will come to us. Those people who lack integrity, they'll look sweet and kind and loving. Inwardly they are ferocious wolves. But by, your, by their fruit, you will recognize them. This is good. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from, or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Of course, Jesus is just talking in generalities here. A good apple tree can, may occasionally produce a bad piece of fruit, but it doesn't mean the tree is worthless. However, if an apple tree just constantly is, is putting out a whack of bad fruit, it's probably because the tree is bad. Yeah? Now, Jesus is talking in this passage how it is that we can know false prophets. Prophets are just people who speak for God. And he's also talking about how we can know ourselves. How is it that we can know ourselves? Here's the test. We can recognize ourselves by our fruit. What is the fruit that Jesus is talking about here? He's not talking about religious work. He's not talking about things that we, great things that we do for Jesus because uh, he uses an example later on where he's talking about uh, somebody who performed great works and yet he says, I don't even know them. So what is fruit? Fruit is Christ-likeness. Fruit is uh, the same fruit that's spelled out for us in Galatians, which I'll read to you here. The fruit of the Spirit. How will you know that the Spirit of God is living inside of us? The fruit of it is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5.22. These are the fruits by which the Jesus followers will be known. If you're not a Jesus follower, phew, you don't got to deal with this. But the Jesus followers, you'll be known by that. Examine yourselves. The Bible tells us, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. A minister I was talking to once said, you know, I've got a, a graduate degree in divinity. I've got 2,000 theology books on the shelves on my wall, yet nothing in my personal life indicates the presence of Christ. He said, I have no love, no joy, no peace, no great news is, is that recognizing that was their first step towards realizing that they need to work on the contents and become a man of integrity. Each one of us needs to take a long, hard look at ourselves, a long, hard look at the fruit of our lives that we are producing. Do we treat others with love? Is there a sense of joy about our life? Do we experience God's peace. Are you patient when things don't go your way? Do you treat others with kindness? Do you good, do good when you have every opportunity? Are you faithful to God? Are you faithful to your friends? Are you faithful to your spouse, to your boss? When you have to correct somebody, do you do it with gentleness? When things don't go your way, do you practice self-control? Man, if our examination of ourselves turns up 
nothing but rotten fruit, then something needs to be fixed. We need to come to God and say, God, the content of my life is not what it is that it should be. Please come into my life. Change me. Make me different. Take away the bitterness and fill my heart with joy. Take away the inner turmoil and fill my heart with peace. Take away the, the everything about me that isn't like Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that those negative things won't creep back into your life. They will. I had a ton of time this week asking God to take away certain things that creeped up into my life as we were moving houses. Uh, high stress showed the content of what it is that was inside my heart, and it was not pleasant. I had some thing, I had some work to do. I had to let Jesus do some work this week in me. Because I have a, a ton of faults. I am not a perfect leader. I've told you guys that over and over again. If you are thinking that I have it all figured out, if you made the huge mistake of inserting my name into that blank, I am sorry. Pick somebody else. <laughs> I don't have it all figured out. But I really do want to change. I really, I really do want to work on my relationship with Jesus. Um, I want to have integrity. I've seen too many people who don't and the chaos that ensues. Why? Because small breaks in your integrity lead to major disasters in your security. This is the only truth I want you to walk away with this morning. Small breaks in your integrity, tiny, little small breaks. It's those tiny, little small things in your life that lead to major disasters in your security. So I need to recognize those small breaks as soon as I can so they don't lead to major disasters. I need to see the small break, ask forgiveness for it, and allow Jesus to change my thinking in regards to that thing Otherwise, I am absolutely headed for disaster. And examining the breaks sucks. It does, you guys. Examining the fruit of our lives can be painful. But it can also be super rewarding. It can be amazing forgiveness for it. There can be a brand new start as a result of it. It's the only way to ensure your life is actually developing substance where you're not just worried about form where you're not just worried about uh, protecting your image. Why is this important? Jesus tells us why it's important. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, meaning you accept Jesus as your Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, the day that Jesus comes back, many will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not uh, drive out demons? Did we not perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Oh, man. I don't want to hear that. I just don't. And three passages specifically just jumped out at me this week and slapped me upside the heart um, as I was studying this. The first passage that just stood out to me was, he who does the will of my father. The person who enters the kingdom of heaven is the person who does God's will. That's what it comes down to. Not doing what it is that you want, but doing what it is that he wants. Surrendering your will to his will, letting him call the shots in your life. And that is a question that I just constantly have to ask myself and that you might want to write down right now. It's this question. I know I'm busy, but am I busy doing God's will? I I'm telling you right now, if you are like, going to write something down today, if you're going to tweet something, it probably should be this because you're going to have to come back to it often. I know I'm busy. Probably isn't anybody in here who's like, oh, I'm just so bored all the time. <laughs> okay, maybe there are a few of you, but come and talk to me about that. We'll work on that real quick. I'll give you some of the things that I'm doing. All right? I know I'm busy, but am I busy doing God's will? He who does the will of my Father. Second thing that jumped out to me in this passage is away from me, you evildoers. Jesus speaks these words to people who have spoken for God. 
These are people who have cast out demons, performed miracles, done crazy things for God in, all in his name, and yet he calls them evildoers. Now these are all flashy, high profile aspects of ministry. You notice they did not say, Lord, did we not feed the poor in your name? Lord, did we not show love to unbelievers in your name? Lord, did we not reach out to the helpless and give a helping hand? They didn't say those things. Jesus didn't call those people evildoers because it's oftentimes the religious things, the high profile things, the things that get you noticed by other people that we do for show that we'll bring up and be proud about. Jesus called them evildoers because every religious thing they did was for show and never went beyond that. We see this attitude sometimes here at this church. Some people only want to serve in the glamorous ministries such as playing in the band or praying for people up front or leading a group of people or teaching a class, but they're not willing to pick up garbage. They're not really willing to serve um, in children's ministry and connect kids. They're not uh, willing to help set up early in the morning. The things that are behind the scenes, they're not really interested in. Jesus is saying that if your spiritual life consists of only what it is that you do in front of others, then you don't really have a spiritual life. It's the, one of the reasons that the directors of this church, the leaders of, our, of this church, are constantly going to serve the homeless because we recognize that we're in a high-profile ministry. And don't get me wrong, I need to do more because, to be really honest, I am constantly in the public eye. I, am, I so miss the days when I first started at this church and I could just vacuum, even though I hate vacuuming. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> Satan might have invented the vacuum. <laughs> and yet, I could do it by myself. I did it when nobody else was around and it was just me saying, God, I love you, I hate this. God, I love you, I hate this. God, I love you, this sucks. But God, this is just for you. And I don't have that much of an opportunity to do that anymore because it seems like I'm always at the forefront, always doing something that is in the public. Where do you serve where the only reward is the reward that God will give you in heaven. Another phrase that jumped out to me here was, I never knew you. And this phrase tells us what it is that Jesus really wants. This phrase cuts to the core of this. He wants to be able to say, yes, I know you. That it's a personal relationship that Jesus seeks with us and that we must seek with him. And I think that is really the most important part. You guys, if you guys, this is so important. I think he just wants you to seek him. And I think that is the most important thing, that we just have to seek a relationship with, with him more. It doesn't matter what it is that you do or how it is that you do it that's most important. It's the desire inside of you that Jesus is looking for. And, and, and what it is that you need to probably do is desire a closer relationship with Jesus. Pray for a greater desire to pray more. Pray for a greater desire to read your Bible more. Pray for a greater desire to connect with other Christ followers more. Not what it is that you need to do, but the desire to do it. Seek him. Stop pretending. Stop faking it. Stop putting on a show and start dealing with those cracks in your character that need work. You know, the Titanic was in the news recently. Did you know that scientists say that it was actually just a series of salt, small slits, not a giant gash that actually sank the Titanic? That the opulent 900-foot uh, sea cruiser uh, in 1912 on its First maiden voyage from England to New York, 1,500 people died in the, in the worst maritime disaster of the time. And the most widely held theory was that it hit an iceberg, caused a huge gash in the side, and then it sunk as a result of it. But recently, a, a group of scientists went down there, and using uh, ultrasound, 
They were probing the wreckage underneath the, the, the years of mud, and, and the damage that they see to the hull was actually really small. Instead of a huge gash, what they found were six tiny slits, the largest one being the size of my hand in the hull. And those six tiny slits filled with water filled the six compartments that eventually caused the ship to sink. Small damage, invisible to most, can not only sink a great ship, but a great reputation. Small breaks in your integrity lead to major disasters in your security. Proverbs puts it this way, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. We've all known people whose private lives didn't match up to their public image. Uh, it's happened to politicians, it's happened to religious leaders, happened to athletes, happened to entertainers. But it doesn't have to happen to you. Your private life can match your public image. But it won't happen by accident. It will happen only by the presence of God in your life, by being in a relationship <coughs> where you are actively seeking God. You must focus on the content of your life rather than just the package. If your private life isn't what it should be, Jesus can help you change. He can help you build the content of your life into something that pleases him. Examine your life. Ask Jesus to take away everything that is not like him. Get to know him. Strive to do his will. This defines the difference between form and content. This defines the difference between spirituality and religion. Between integrity and hypocrisy. Ask Jesus to fix the breaks in your armor before disaster strikes. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, this was a tough message for me. You know it. And this is probably a tough message for a few other people. Lord, there are some cracks in our lives that show up as a result of the fruit of our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is not evident in some of the areas of our lives. We don't treat others with love. Kindness is not at the forefront of our ways. We don't correct others with gentleness. There isn't humility when we are in conflict with other people. There isn't self-control. We just tend to fly off the handle. Instead, there's just anger, dysfunction, selfishness, pride. Lord, you see those cracks that are in us. Lord, help us stop pretending this morning. Help us stop putting on a good face. Instead, we just invite Jesus into our lives in a greater way, in a greater measure. We want more of the Holy Spirit and less of ourselves. We want to conform our lives to be more like Jesus and make our lives less of what it is that we think the form should be. We want more content. We recognize that content comes from relationship, from spending time with you. Lord, we need more desire this morning more desire for the things of you, more desire for connection with you, more desire to spend time with you, more desire to talk to you, more desire to learn about you. So Lord, fill us up this morning with a fresh sense of your call on our lives. We don't want to be busy, distracted with lesser things. That's exactly what it is that Satan wants for us, to just be distracted from doing what it is that you're called us to do. Lord, we want to be able to say, yes, I'm busy, and yes, I am busy doing God's will for my life. And the only way that we discover that is by spending time with you regularly. So Lord, we want more of a desire for that. Fill us with that. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you have some cracks that you just don't know how it is that you're going to mend, don't know how it is that you're going to fix, um, maybe come and talk with one of the directors will have some of them standing up here at the end, some other leaders up front here. You can get some ideas. Maybe we'll put a book in your hand. Maybe we'll just encourage you. Um, but if you have some areas in your life that you just 
need some help with, uh, then feel free to come down afterwards as everybody else heads out. Cool? Next week, uh, we have uh, something really cool planned uh, as we continue on with our series, and I'm not even going to tell you what that is. You're going to have to come and check it out yourself. Even though those of you watching online, you're going to have to come check it out yourself. Okay? Have a great week. Be blessed.